Hello and welcome to all of you gardeners across Mid-America. This is Mid-American Gardener, so you're in the right place. Glad that you joined us. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I will handle questions, oh, maybe cut flowers, perennials, landscaping, something like that. But I want to introduce the panel who are with me and it's a great lineup. Wait till you see who's here and direct your questions towards their expertise and it will be a great show. Thank you so much. First off, I'm gonna throw it over to you, Dave Poussard. Thank you, I'm Dave Poussard from the Garden Center at Hare Nursery and I'm the manager there and I'm a certified arborist. So my expertise is in woody plants or trees, so yeah. Do, shall I go with you this? You go right All on right. into this it, is that'd a be great. Sample I brought from my yard. This is a yew branch. The yews are the plants that you see in front of a lot of uh, homes. And this is a canker. What you see here is a canker that is formed on the stem. And I brought it mainly because it, as on the show, we often talk about diseases and they may mention cankers. People don't often know what the cankers are. so. I'm showing the canker here so you have an idea what a canker is. Kind of a sunken area on the stem. Oddly, this is a Hicks U that I have no idea why the canker mm. is on here because cankers um, don't usually form on Hicks U's and Hicks U's don't usually have problems. So I have done some research trying to find out what the problem is and I haven't been able to. So even when you're an expert on things, you don't always have an answer. And I think it's admirable, you could, we could admit. When we don't know, we often say, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And it still continued to leaf out above it. There oh, was, and it so. looks beautiful. I didn't even realize it until I went to trim them back. And then I saw a whole bunch of the stems had this. So I'm not sure what the, there's no reason that it should be having it, but okay. that's and the way no it is. And no difficulty from it. No difficulty, for this no symptoms, they're in shade, there's nothing that could have been scraping the bark and yeah. Okay, well when you find out, hopefully it's just a blip on the screen. Yeah, I think I'll nothing. send it to the plant clinic okay. at some point and maybe they can find out what it is for Very me. Very good. Yeah. And we do have a plant clinic screen, we might have to put that up. It's in Turner Hall in, at the Urbana campus at U of I. So we might have to do that. Well, thank you very much for mm -hmm. that. And now we're gonna go next to Karen Ruckel. Hi, Karen. Hi, I work also at Hair Nursery in Peoria and I am in sales, trees, shrubs, a little bit of perennials. And what I brought to show is a petunia that I wanted to talk about that exceeded my expectations this year. And a lot of times we get plants and, and some things just don't go as well or they don't get as, as pretty as we think we would want them to get. Now this is looking a little shabby. This has been two, through two freezing nights wow. up on a deck. So it's, it's looking a little bad, but I brought some pictures to show what the plant looked like through the summer. And the first picture, this was taken uh, July 24th and it's on my deck. And as you can see, it is just a mass of blooms and that's probably about a 24 inch pot and then the next picture is from 1028 so in the end wow. of October and it was still blooming pretty good but it, it wasn't as as pretty as earlier in the season but I just couldn't believe it was a proven winners it was called a Vista bubblegum plant and Vista bubblegum Vista bubblegum and I've actually had the plant since February because I went to a proven winter show and barely kept it alive to put it out. So I had that plant for nine months and it, it was just spectacular. Vista bubblegum. So, you know, sometimes you buy plants and they just, you know, the, the magazines look so beautiful, but when you put them in your yard, but this one exceeded my expectations of blooming. Very good. I think if viewers have a plant like that, they should also email it to us and send a picture. Not the Vista bubblegum, but whatever <laughs> plant it is, unless it is. Well, great, thank you, Karen. And I wanna segue into the plant clinic screen. We mentioned it about the canker and Dave is gonna send it in, but there is a price per sample, but they do a great job. So there is the address in Urbana on South Goodwin Street. Are they oh. still open? Yes, and they open, I think, Oh my, they might just be at the end of their yeah. window. Oh. I have to check. If they're still open, I'll send it now. 
I thought maybe they were closed by now. You, I, I think you might be right. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so in the spring, that is the plant cleaning. But thank you for bringing that up because it's not as active of a season, so I know they don't stay open the whole year. Okay, now Ella, you have been so patient. Let's talk next to Ella Maxwell. Hi, I work at Hair Nursery too, and I can answer most of the questions as well. Uh, trees, shrubs, perennials. And I did bring a plant to share. It's really a, I just want people to know about it. This is a honeysuckle, and uh, this is a wild honeysuckle. It's uh, Ammer honeysuckle, and you'll see it along the roadsides. And what makes it bad is it is an invasive exotic, so it's not native to Illinois, but you'll see it in the woodlands, and it's, uh, it still has its leaves. So when you're driving, uh, you'll be able to see it, but it has a lot of uh, red berries here, and I took the leaves off so you can just see these berries, and of course the berries, birds disseminate them or they just drop, and these little honeysuckles just come up everywhere, and that's how they're colonizing. And now is a really good time to it got the roots got stuck in the table. <laughs> uh, is to be able to pull is to be able to pull one out, and uh, you can see that the root system's rather shallow. So you had mentioned that that you pull them out, and and that's what I do right now because you can still see them. Uh, everything else has lost its leaves, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a noxious little thug. Well, I had planted some daffodils yesterday, and there's the little honeysuckle, and and it's moist enough in some locations that they just come out really quick and in the summer they are not so quick to come out. So it, it is a good time if you have smaller ones. Now, not the big ones. Well, the, you, the big ones will pop right out with a shovel. There you go. So be doing that because it's, it's a mess. It, yeah, it can just take over and shade all kinds of things. And you've got to be con vigilant and consistent with it because mm -hmm. birds do disseminate it. All right, thank you for all of your good show and tell, and let's go to the phone lines next. We might do a little did you know here in a minute, but let's go to the phone lines because Charles on line one has been waiting patiently uh, to talk about a persimmon tree. Hi, Charles. Line one, what's your question for us? I'm not hearing anything. We'll uh, talk on that. Oh, Charles, what's your question? I, I think we can hear them, but they're not hearing us. All right, maybe we'll come back to him. Let's try the line two caller, Lynn. Hi there, do you have a question for us? I do, it's about hydrangea. Okay. Um, they don't seem to look the same this year. They're not drying, they're not dried out like they usually are. They're kind of really moist feeling, and I didn't. I don't usually cut them down in, in the uh, winter months. I usually wait until the spring, but should I cut them down the way they are right now? I, uh, I know the ones that I have and then some up by my sons, they're both the same. They're very wet. I would not cut them down. They are going to dry. It's just been a cooler, moister fall and the summer was not as drying. So these late blooming hydrangeas, the paniculata types, will, will dry and they'll have nice winter interest. So don't cut them back. So it's interesting how each year is a little different. We had more moisture this year, so it yeah. must be the difference. Okay, well, thank you very much for that question, Lynn. Let's move on to Tony's question about uh, fungus, and this is on line three. Hi, Tony. Hey, how you doing, Diane? Great. What's your uh, question? First, first uh, I don't know exactly what this is, I, I was told it, it was uh, kind of like a mushroom that grows underneath the ground and, and it's like a, if you step on it when it's dry, it's like a smoke bomb. Sure. Okay, we've got Do you a... you guys have any idea, I mean, know what I'm talking about? We've got some nodding heads over here. Who would like to start <laughs> in on this? Okay. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, who, whoever oh, wants to tackle this. Okay. Uh, huh? It, well... He's fading out. Yeah. Oh, okay. He is, uh, this is a uh, mushroom, and uh, when you step on them, that's the spores that are releasing. And mo depending on, did he say where it was located that he stepped on? If it was in the grass or in the mulch or he 
what he didn't really say that uh -uh. did he no if it's yeah. in the grass sometimes it can be representative of a lawn disease but also it can just be uh, decaying uh, matter that's in the soil and then they the, the uh, mushrooms appear because it is part of the process during the decomposition and then those are the fruiting bodies that are going to let really be released the spores and uh, other times you will seed it in mulch and when it's in mulch that also is just part of the decaying process and sometimes it looks ugly but it really doesn't do any problem so it, if it were one of the diseases in the lawn then you would need to uh, take care of it but it's not really clear and we can't really determine right. that at this point point. and we did have more than usual this year with the consistent moisture mm -hmm. it seemed like right and the um, fruiting body that he's referring to is commonly referred to as a uh, puff ball yes mm -hmm. and it has a different shape it doesn't open up like the little umbrella that a toadstool mm -hmm. would do and uh, again um, probably not to worry if you just go with a rake and break them off they'll uh, they're mostly water and they'll just dry out to nothing uh, but if you leave them long enough they will create the spores that will be released and with the well, and, and don't you think some people forget maybe 10 to 15 years ago they removed a tree mm -hmm. and they forget about some mm -hmm. that spot or maybe you know it's a little bit of ways and with a wet year like this we we get it's sure weird fungus like that popping up it just tells you where it was and there's still something to decay yeah. so all of these were good ideas so hopefully that helped you tony okay let's move along to uh susan's question about roses on line four hi susan Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I have two first-year David Austin climber roses, and they have been absolutely beautiful. They have bloomed up until frost. Great. Go right ahead. Oh, we lost her. We don't know what the question is. Oh, I hope we can get Susan back. We want to know. Oh, well, okay. And she probably wants to know how to protect them. So Let, She wants to know how to protect them. <laughs> That's right. All right, you three. Right. I can think tell. she wants to know how to protect them. All so, right. Thank you, Ella. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> well, uh, the, most of the climbing roses um, are very hardy, and the canes can just, uh, you don't have to cut them back, and just make sure that they're secured so that the winter weather won't rip them down off of the trellis. Uh, some people want to protect them more and they actually will take them down and lay them onto the ground and, and cover them. I think that David Austin's probably would not require something so uh, drastic. I think she can just go through the winter uh, making sure that the base of the plant is mulched well. We're going to say that for Susan. So, Susan, that's what we think <laughs> you were going to ask. Okay, thank you so much for your question. Let's do the uh, Did You Know segment next, and then we're going to have a few more emails. Let's go. No garden is complete without some chrysanthemums. Gardeners love growing these colorful flowers in the fall, which bloom abundantly in the shades of yellow, whites, reds, pinks, and purples. They continue to bloom when other flowers have already faded and wilted away, as long as they get enough sun. One aside about chrysanthemums, we get a lot of questions about how do you keep them over the winter, mm -hmm. and I think they need to be mulched well, planted early enough to be established, which would not be probably late November after Thanksgiving, <laughs> so plant it early. Trim back a little bit, wouldn't you say deadhead just the top yes. so they don't lodge mm -hmm. over? Any other? ideas for well, overwintering? Well, uh, that was one of the questions <gasps> that I had okay. on the mums. Okay, well then let's not go ahead and do your mum question okay. and then we'll go back the opposite uh, direction. My, my mum question was, I noticed the mums that I just planted a month ago or so are growing roots out of the stems. I discovered this when I started snooping around because the blooms were beginning to fade. Excellent. And what would cause this? And uh, I think it's just, these are adventitious roots that are coming out around the stem. And uh, because of uh, maybe the moisture and humidity in the dense mum uh, foliage. So the best thing to do, what I would do is, is 
put some soil up around these mums, mulch them well, and those roots could help to establish the mum to carry it through the winter longer. Well, I just knew you had a question about that. <laughs> there we go. And that did segue nicely. Excellent. Very yes. good. Well, let's go back the other way then. Karen, you want to do your sh uh, email? Yes, I have a question um, from Dave, who had some tor spireas that were planted in 2008, trimmed, doing fine, but then they started dropping a bunch of leaves. But another spirea close by, magic carpet, seemed unaffected. So it looks by the, the beautiful pictures that, that you sent in, it looks like it has a foliar fungal disease, a leaf spot disease. We saw a lot of problems with that this year, the cool wet spring we had, then we went warm, then we had a lot of cool nights later in the summer and dampness that then we saw a resurgence of a lot of leaf problems. I couldn't tell if you had irrigation in your yard that can sometimes compound getting the leaves constantly wet can can make the problem a little worse so i would say hopefully they're going to be okay now the thing is spirea are very tough the thing is if your spirea were were stressed with something else and then how they were affected with this leaf spot disease you could have a little bit of problem so i would say next spring as they just start to leaf out cut them back hard if you do see a lot of dead areas within them to try to fl flush out some new growth and if at all possible don't get the leaves wet if you are having to water them or if you are having an irrigation system have it go off early in the day so that the leaves dry by that that day going into the nighttime. okay very good and now dave it's you all right we have a good spot for a bald cypress but are thinking ahead to its maturity because it's deciduous which means it loses its leaves, it seems there might be a tremendous amount of needles falling every year. Do you rake and compost them, use them for mulch? Do the needles decay more rapidly than other conifers? Well, actually they do drop and unlike most conifers, which is why they're called a bald cypress, and they can be used for a mulch. They, unlike a lot of the conifers, they're actually kind of a a leaf of needles that drop rather than individual needles. So when they drop, they kind of collect, they're easy to rake up, and you can put them in a compost pile, you can use them as a mulch. Uh, they're, in fact, Ella actually works with them, and they're able to uh, provide a good mulch like other needles would. So yeah, I, I think you can do any of those things with them. Well, I, I do have one caveat. My friend had a uh, little, poodles, toy poodles, and the dog's fur caught those tremendously, and she hated her bald cypress <laughs> and took it out because every fall she was grooming her dogs. So if you can plant poodles. a bald cypress if you don't have a poodle. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you learned it here first, folks. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for those answers. Let's go to the phone lines again. And Barb has a question for us on line one about Hoyas. Hi there, Barb. Hi, I enjoy your show very much. Thank you. And I've had this Hoya forever and ever and ever, and it blooms occasionally, and it's probably, oh, I don't know, six foot long. Great. It likes to vine over the curtain rod. Okay. <laughs> Should I ever repot this thing? I've never repotted it since I had it given to me by an older lady. You know, I've yeah. never repotted my Hoyas. Uh, that's right. It's a it's a plant that can be pot bound, and as long as you're providing nutrients with fertilizer, and it seems to be happy. But I would say the minute you try potting it, that's the end. So don't break the streak. I've had the soil sink down in it, you know, when you have a plant that you've had a long time. So I have refurnished, you know, some soil at the top, but don't cover the stem. I think it just sifts out with watering, but I've never repotted. I, I'm sure mine's 10, yeah, 15 I'd, years I'd old. Yeah, it'd be fine. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna say it's not broken, so you don't have to do anything <laughs> <laughs> to fix it. But thank you for that question, because a lot of times you do need to repot. And there are a few plants that um, often do better without it. Okay, let's move along to line five. Steve has a dahlia question for us. Hi, Steve. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I dug my canna and dahlia bulbs all a week or so ago when we had the warmer, drier weather. Yes. And I lay it, let them out to dry 
and now I like to know how to uh, survive them through the winter. Okay, so caring for dahlia bulbs after digging. Who wants to I, jump in on that? I dug my dahlia bulbs, and this has worked very well for me. Uh, dahlias, as opposed to cannas, really like to be stored warmer. So uh, I put my cannas just in um, a cardboard box in my basement, not too deep. Uh, but my dahlias, I wrap them in newspaper, and I put them again in another sack or cardboard box, but I store them upstairs in a, a closet where the temperatures are warmer. That's worked very well for me. And I'm sure it will for him. So it's nice and you don't have to have a huge space. You can store one in each spot and not right. take up too much room. So good question and dahlias are so beautiful. So it's worth digging them. Okay, let's go to another question on Iris. And this is uh, Susie's question on line six. Hi, Susie. Hi. Uh, my question, I have a beautiful big blue Siberian iris with those little lovely blue blooms. Mm -hmm. And every year, I think I'm going to dig it. Several years I've tried. It's a, the whole base of it is, I guess, ingrown and totally impossible to get out of the ground. So what do you suggest and when would be a better time to um, dig up or what's the best time to dig up Siberian iris? Okay. Karen, you, you have Siberian iris. Well, I, I dug mine in spring. And the mm -hmm. thing is, like what you're already seeing, that clump is really tight. You've got to be vicious. You're going to kill <laughs> some of them. There's no way to nicely tease them out from each other. You just go in there. Um, I've used a spade, and I've dug the clump, and then I've, I've just arbitrarily chosen an area and sliced through there. Um, one thing that I think makes it much easier though is that if you start and you dig up the whole clump and you turn it upside down and you put the shovel through the bottom rather than coming up through the top, it's much easier to cut all your grasses that way as well. I've, I've found so for iris, anything with a dense root system, if you get it from underneath, it, it really is better. And uh, give her just an idea, like a handful size or whatever she wants, I suppose. Right. But the smaller the clump, the less likely you have to do it again <laughs> Quicker, soon. Yeah. Is, yeah. is <laughs> my takeaway on that from having done it before. So you do. You have to get vicious. That is kind of the word. Um, I've and I sharpen my spade sometimes to make it easier. Easier to cut through. So okay. So Siberian iris, well worth it. Very long lasting. I think we can get another uh, question in on from Mary about moms. This is great on line three. Hi, Mary. Have a mom question from Mary? I don't hear anything from her, so. All right, well, let's see if we can go to our mag quiz. Let's go to that segment next. If you want to attract hummingbirds to your garden, you should A, hum, B, grow watermelons, C, plant red flowers. C, plant red flowers. It is believed that hummingbirds favor red flowers because they are the ones most likely not eaten by insects. Insects don't see red very well, and they're more likely to skip red flowers, leaving more nectar in the red flowers for the hummingbirds to find. Hummingbirds are great. I do have them come to other colors, though, uh, but they have said red for a long time. Columbine, penstemon, columbine are purple, penstemon are white. What do you get hummingbirds on in your garden? My, my tried and true is a, an annual for us is black and blue salvia. Oh, yes, and that's not red. No. Nope. That's right. The no, best way to get hummingbirds is with a feeder. I have best luck <laughs> well, with that's salvia. Well, no, I do that, too. You but, have what? But I planted the black and blue salvia, but they did not go to that. They went to my red salvia. So, See? Yeah. And I had pineapple sage one year that flowers late. Oh, it's beautiful. And it was right next to my door on the deck, and the hummingbirds were coming right to my door on the deck because, oh. and it was a late nectar source before they left. Mm -hmm. I think they stayed a little later this year because it was warmer later. So anyway, the hummingbirds, I, we've seen quite a few, and we've seen quite a few monarchs this year. Yeah. So yes. hopefully we've had an upsurge 
and, and it's cyclical, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was an interesting thing. It's not always red flowers, but it often pans out that way. Well, I must say, I'm glad to have had all of the hair nursery folks here from Peoria. Thank you. We Thank you. get them as a triplet. A trio comes together, <laughs> and we're glad that they've come, and thank you for all your expertise. I want to thank each of you folks for watching because we really, you know, enjoy bringing you education about gardening and entertaining at the same time. Well, we hope that you'll get out and do some fall things. There's still time, so have a great week gardening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.